Mabuhay! Welcome to our panel, which is Stories from the Campo. And uh, we have four presenters here today. Um, my name is Luna Jamero, and I grew up in a Filipino labor camp, uh, which was owned and operated by my parents, uh, and which was established in 1944 in Livingston, California. And my name is June Horlador Bond, and I grew up in a Filipino labor camp in, near Terminus, which is near Stockton and Lodi, California. Hi, I'm Erwin Mina. I grew up in a camp just east of Delano, uh, and it was owned by the Bazanich Corporation. Hi, I'm Sam Mina, and I, I actually uh, lived in two camps in the 1950s. We lived uh, uh, at the Divisage camp. Uh, outside of Delano, California. And in the 60s, uh, we were at the, the Bazanich camp, uh, again, uh, in the Delano area. Thank you. And before we get into the rest of our presentation, I wanted to give a brief overview of the Manong generation especially the bachelor monos that we grew up with, that we grew up with at the labor camps, um, and why they, why they became met, uh, bachelors. Uh, many, of, many of them were recruited to work in the fields, the plantations of Hawaii and the fields of California during the 1920s when the labor supply from China and Japan dwindled. And of course they were told by the, the recruiters that the streets were paved with gold and America was a land of opportunity. Many of the Manongs were from barrios and they were looking to, to uh, seek better opportunities, education, better job opportunities. And of course, this was a, this was a ticket they, they felt uh, to improve their lives. And they did not find that, unfortunately. But some of the laws that, that kept them um, in the conditions that they endured as Manongs, as bachelor Manongs for many years, uh, one of the laws that um, impacted their lives was in, in 1935. The Tidings McDuffie Act was enacted, and that limited the um, immigration of Filipinos to 50 a year. This did not change until um, 1965 when the Immigration and Nationality Act uh, was passed, and that enabled more Filipinos to come here to America. But for many of the Filipinos that came here in the 20s and the 30s, they, uh, it was much too late for them to realize the, their dreams of better education and, um, and careers. Many of them were stuck in the cycle of, of working in the fields for most of their lives. They also had no protection of civil rights. Many of them uh, faced um, very poor living conditions in many of the camps that they lived in. Our Manungs also faced uh, discrimination, and in in society, uh, there were uh, they, uh, one of the things that they could not do, uh, although there were some that did, was to marry, especially marry outside of their race. And of course, the Filipino women, the Pinais, were uh, not very uh, that not many. Uh, were the ratio to to Filipino men were probably something like in the neighborhood of a hundred to one, so they didn't really have opportunity to marry uh, Pinais. So the miscegenation laws uh, were not even lifted until 1967. So obviously, you know, many of the Manoans were uh, way too old to get married. However, some did after uh, they were able to get Social Security. Some of them did return to the Philippines, and they came back with Filipino wives. And I think that's another story to be told, is the, the Manongs who um, 
brought back and started families in their 60s, in their late 60s, even in their 70s. So, you know, this is, this is the Manon Bachelor Society that we're talking about. We wanted to give a profile of who that was. Many of them, as I said, they were young men. They came over in their late teens, and most of them did not marry. Many of them died without families. Uh, many of them were known to us who lived with them on the campus. On the campus, they were our family as well. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Erwin, who's going to talk a little bit more about uh, what a Filipino labor camp looked like. Hi, I'd like to do a brief description of the Filipino labor camps. And, you know, Sam and I agree with, with Luna's uh, layout of, of the Livingston camp, as well as descriptions by June. Um, the center of, of life in the camp was basically the kitchen. The kitchen was, uh, 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 for, for our camp in Delano, uh, was, was for, at times at the height peak season, was probably of over 100, maybe 125 or more men that, that, that they would feed. Now, this was done primarily by my mom, who uh, would, would cook three, three meals, you know, starting at 2.30 in the morning, uh, preparing the meals, getting the men out, uh, of the kitchen and then starting over again with all the utensils uh, for a hundred, 125 plus men, uh, mugs, silverware, plates, glasses, and, and then all the cooking uh, pots to be cleaned and then start all over with the preparation for lunch and then start that whole process over for dinner. Now, in describing the, the kitchen, uh, there were very, very large walks. They were probably, I'd say, a meter, uh, at least a meter across, um, about three feet across, that were used to fry, were used to cook rice, used to cook um, main course dinners. And then, of course, there was a stove, and all of this was gas. Uh, in, in, in the preparation area, there were several tables that were uh, all aligned in, in a row where, where they would cut the, the produce, they cut the meat, and then they would they would uh, actually cook cook on on those uh, large vats and, and uh, walks. Now, after the preparation, there was another table that was uh, probably ten feet long by maybe three feet across, where you would put all the food. And it was a kind of a I hate to say it, uh, this is a, a visual a buffet style, but there were just pots. And, and big ladles where, where people would scoop out and, and then the plates, um, it, it would be a sequential thing. And if you, if you look in, in to the actual eating area, there were large, long tables with long benches um, to, to account for uh, up towards, uh, to account for all these hundred men, but not all at one time. Because uh, again, the, the, the the place was not large enough to handle all 100 at one time. So moving forward, there is a, a you, you, you talk about the uh, dormitory where, where places where the men slept. In, in our case, we had three of them and, and they were back-to-back, uh, -back, two of them were back-to-back -back, um, dormitories where out the 15 rooms would, would face outward and uh, you know, there was two, two of those, and then there was another long greenhouse, and that, that accounted for the majority of the men. Now, if you, if you look at the facilities, um, you, you, you think about people who have to work in the fields, you have to understand that they have to not only uh, eat, but they also have restroom facilities. Now, in our particular case, the toilets were like nine across. There were nine toilets next to each other, Staggered were the toilet papers, and you know they didn't want to. There was no partition, so uh, you know the guy next to you, you guys could share the role. <laughs> now, uh, the 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 whole idea there was uh, it was about moving a lot of people and and the indignities that were associated with that. The showers there were probably fourteen heads where the men would take turns and, and get. Uh, go and shower in the, in the shower house. 
Now, the drainage there was very, very crude. It was, it was a tilted slab of cement where it would just run off mm-hmm. and it would be sort of a boggy area where, uh, you know, water would collect. And outside the showers were uh, a trough style of, of, of sinks that where men could brush their teeth, shave, uh, do like laundry, uh, just do a light cleanup there. And then finally, there was a, a, an area where uh, we, we called it, it was just a, a covered area, and, and in Hawaii, they would call it a lanai, where there was a barbershop chair, there's uh, tables where people could, could gamble, you know, with the military style blankets on top, do their palalasi, do their haiku and their, their dominoes. And, and basically, that was the place of where people learned, and, and the education where me and, and Sam will, will talk, talk a little bit about later is where we learned about social events, we learned about life, we, 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 our takeaways, uh, and then how, how it affected us. Uh, mm-hmm. So in general, that, that was our, our, our camp. We were, we were about seven miles east of Delano, down Willems Road and 65. And for us, the camp meant that we had to go to school as well, so we had to walk a quarter of a mile down to Highway 65 where the bus would pick us up. And that was, you know, the, the camp was was a place of reverence. It was a place for all of us that, where we grew up. And a, a lot of a lot of it is uh, is is what what kind of made us who we were and mm-hmm. who we are. Mm-hmm. Our our camp um, uh, was very similar in that it's interesting that you use the word dormitories yeah. because we call them bunk houses. That's right. And we had three bunk houses. One of of the bunk houses, I guess there were four before our family came. Uh, but one ho- one building was converted into a home for our family. And then there were the three bunk houses and the kitchen, which was again the hub of all of the activity. Uh, our kitchen looked very much as as Irwin described. We had the walks, we did the buffet uh, kind of serving. We had long cafeteria type tables. And we, our family, ate with the men. My mother didn't ask us to get up super early, so we had breakfast at our home, but lunch and dinner was with the rest, was with everyone. And um, uh, the, the ranch was uh, 2,000 acres. Uh, my father was a foreman and his main responsibility was irrigation. Uh, and uh, there were maybe 30 to 35 men that stayed with us year round, stayed there in the camp year round. And then that number would double during very the busier times. We we're located about 10 miles east of uh, Lodi, near what they call Terminus, California. We were about a mile, two miles from the river. And um, we were in the middle of a peat dirt field, uh, which is a dark, moist uh, uh, dirt that's very, very itchy. And with the heat, you men had to really cover up so that they wouldn't get that that dirt in in, uh, touching their bodies. Um, The other thing is, as Erwin said, um, the schools weren't close. I remember riding the bus into Lodi 45 minutes each way to get to the high school and uh, having to stop along the way to pick up the kids at the different farms. Um, We were about 20 miles from Stockton. So very similar uh, in terms of uh, the the ownership and uh, again my father was a foreman my mother didn't cook she helped manage uh, and the menus and uh, helped with uh, man helping the men manage their monies um, and uh, but we had three cooks that that cooked for us so but my, my experience was very similar to uh, what you've heard already. Although our property was owned by uh, mom and papa, they purchased it in 1944. But at that time, they themselves could not buy property, so it had to be put in my older brother's name. But 
because it was a property they they own, of course, they had to bring on or build the, the outhouse, the bunkhouse, and also we had a, a pool hall built on the property as well. And the interesting thing about the pool hall is that the pool tables were brought in first on the floor of what was to become the pool hall, and then the Manongs, the men, built around the pool table. Mm. That pool hall is still standing. It's been remodeled at least two times already, but uh, it was the gathering place for, for the men after they came home from a hot day in the field. But not only was it a gathering place for them, it also was a, uh, a place for some of the local Filipino families uh, to gather. And, and in the pool hall, there were things like gambling, uh, wrinkle rummy, they, they had haiku. Uh, we as children were serving beer and wine, selling cigarettes and, and doing things that um, we probably weren't supposed to do, but you know, um, we, we did and, and we, did, we also had chicken fights in, in the back. And of course, the camps that you guys grew up in because they were company owned, I doubt that you had chicken fights back there. No, but we, no, no, we did. But they did, wow. Well, we did. We, we didn't. But the, we but, did. but the owners probably looked the other way. We, <laughs> we, had, uh, we had regular sabons uh, every Sunday. So that was um, part of the Campo life too. Campo life was, was what the recreation that brought the Manungs in touch with other Kababayans and other families other than our own. So um, that was the experience that, that I grew up with. And um, it, was, it, it was also, as far as who actually staffed and who did all the work, uh, who did the kitchen prep, who did the cleaning, who went to buy the, uh, who went to go to the store, who bought the supplies, the children, uh, meaning me, you know, uh, my siblings, we all were, uh, the workers. We lived in a communal. It was a, it was a communal uh, style of living for mm -hmm. sure, mm -hmm. and um, I, I think that's something that many of my own uh, peers did not understand because, you know, I grew up uh, in the '60s. We had the hippie generation, remember? And I remember going to school with a bunch of kids who who said they were going to go live on a commune, and I thought. You're going to go live on a commune? I grew up on a commune, you know, so <laughs> they didn't understand that. But, uh, you know, I, I sometimes you don't realize that the outside world has no idea of what your world is like or was like on the compo. Uh, once you step off that school bus, it, you were back into a totally different world. Mm -hmm. And um, we were told not to really talk about all the uh, illegal activities that went on, especially the chicken fights. So I'm sure you guys might have had similar experiences. I don't know. Sam? You know, I, um, I, I had the, the experience that I, in two different uh, labor camps. In the 1950s, when we first came to America, <clears throat> we were at the visage camp. And at the visage camp, it was uh, much different than the Bozanich camp in the 60s. And maybe later on, we'll have a chance to differentiate that. But at, at the, the visage camp, it was, it was literally, we came to America, San Francisco. My uncle picked us up and we, we were in Delano in a labor camp. And the camp was built by, by the Manungs that were there that they tore down a barn and they, they put up this shack of a house that we lived in for for almost six years. And mm -hmm. the house itself had no uh, hot running water. Everything had to be carried to the, this old beat up stove. Everything was second hand that my dad and I would, my dad would fire it up. And then we, I, I remember uh, taking baths. There was a big green oil drum and we would, uh, we would bring the warm water, hot water to cold water and we would all take turns, my sister and then my next sister, and then I would jump in. And then <clears throat> that, it was, I, it was so, uh, we were so poor that the, the outhouse was, was like, I hated to go there because in the summertime it was full of wasp nests and mice. And in the wintertime it was so cold 
you and my mom would have to escort all her children to the outhouse before we went to sleep and, and the sleeping quarters were you know all u.s uh surplus from world war ii so all of our dishes our bunks our, our blankets were all that my mom would make you know uh pillows with sakuti bagas you know uh sack of rice to to uh for us to to live in. and then so it was it was a uh, it was really low down poverty at, now when i'm thinking back at it and and in fact uh, i that was the beginning of mike's my memories of working in the fields picking cotton with my mom uh mm. which was you know in itself a whole different thing than working in the fields when we were at the Bazanich camp but mm. june mentioned uh, driving riding the bus and that kind of brought back a memory we would ride the bus to go to school and we would pick up I, I realized hey i'm not the only guy that there were other filipino camps we the bus would go to the filipino tour all the different camps in the area pick up the kids and and my my friend later on you know he was on the on the route and he lived in a in a railroad box car mm -hmm. and so it was it, that time period was was a really difficult in terms of poverty everything was was so hard to come by. And so later on, when we, in the 60s, when we moved to um, the Divisage camp, my dad was a foreman. And so therefore we had a little bit of, uh, of say and a little bit of, uh, uh, but it, it wasn't uh, easy as well. So Erwin's probably gonna talk about the beginning of all of that. So, so thanks Sam. I, at the time we were growing up, um, in the 60s, it was a very tumultuous time. The country was was reeling with uh, and, and having uh, to to deal with civil rights, social justice, the strikes, the Vietnam War, and and not to mention when you say social justice, it's, it wasn't just all about um, blacks. It was it was it was the whole gamut of, of, of nationalities. Now. Growing up at that time, it was very, very tough because we were growing up where, um, you know, riding that bus, that 45 minute bus ride, that in itself was exhausting because you were like on an, uh, a local bus ride that would just stop every 500 feet, it seemed like. And by the time you got to school, you were, you were pretty much almost worn out. But yeah, and when you were a kid, that didn't really matter much. But having said that, um, just the the whole environment of um, you know the society that that we were we were dealt with um, and even even at times my dad would not allow us to go out because during the strikes there was a lot of potential of violence and we we uh, we had to, to kind of maneuver ourselves in, in that way um, at that time and, and in the camps um, even even our, our our friends that uh, just a little brief background of Delano. Delano was uh, separated by the railroad tracks. The minorities lived on the west side, blacks, Mexicans, Filipinos, and everybody else. And the Caucasians all lived on the east side. We lived east of Delano, so we were bused into the east side of Delano. Mm -hmm. We we had kind of a, a, a different uh, thing. As, as you left the camp, there was a certain way you had to maintain yourself. You were representing your family. You're representing um, pretty much um, everybody else that, that uh, my parents, you know, had had uh, held in high esteem. So even even on on during the week we had we led a, a kind of a different kind of a lifestyle where um, we were kind of like the, the the noble savages. We were there weren't that many Filipinos, so you had to you had to maintain yourself such that way. Um, on the weekends we would join parties. Uh, and, and even even the, the the Filipinos on the west side kind of treated us a little differently as well. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, that that was that was the interesting part, and that was all part of the Campo life as well. I think we all experienced it was like uh, straddling two cultures, you know, growing up because um, you know we, our parents were very adamant about wanting us to become good Americans, and you know uh, I knew how to speak a little bit of Visayan, but 
uh, we weren't encouraged so much because uh, my older brother spoke nothing but the dialect when he went to school and had some problems in communication. So my mother decided that, you know, she wanted us to speak English. So even though we grew up around the camp of nothing but, you know, dialect, uh, the dialect being spoken every day, uh, I to this day, um, I, I know a few phrases, mostly, mostly all the bathroom, the bathroom phrases, but um, I don't speak it fluently. I wish I did, and that, that's one of, the, one of the regrets I have growing up, that we didn't um, retain our, our language. But um, I want to just tag on what, what, uh, onto what Erin was talking about, and, except I wanted to say something about my father was the cook. He cooked, uh, he was the, uh, he did everything in the kitchen uh, except for the, the prep stuff. He left that up to us. He, he um, wanted, we were the, uh, chopped up the meat, we chopped up the vegetables, we swept the floor, we washed endless dishes. I, we didn't have uh, dishwashers. We also had upwards to um, 100 men at the peak of the season. Mm -hmm. And in Livingston, which is in Merced County, we are, uh, you know, we, we had grape fields surrounding us, peach orchards, sweet potato fields. There was plenty of work for the men, and Papa negotiated uh, with the small farmers that um, he dealt with. He did not deal with uh, the big corporation uh, farmers as uh, I think Irwin's uh, parents' uh, experience was, and I think yours too, June, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, Papa was, uh, had to learn better English himself. And there were several um, Japanese farmers, in fact, mm -hmm. in the local area. So Papa had to really kind of get over himself when it came to, you know, uh, the feelings he had during because of the Japanese occupation during the war days. And uh, that was a very painful time. Yet uh, Papa was very practical. He was, uh, he, he was, he knew how to communicate with them. He dealt with Mennonites. Uh, Mennonites, by the way, uh, were uh, and still are part of the Livingston history. They are, they are a branch of the Amish um, yeah. religion, and many uh, Mennonite farmer, farmers have become very successful. So Papa was able to negotiate with them as well. In fact, uh, he was able to negotiate fair wages to the point where um, he and the farm workers that he represented really did not have the same needs to join uh, the union when Larry Itliong and others were trying to recruit uh, for support because of the fact that he did negotiate for good wages. And I think the living conditions, um, I know Sam, you talked about some of the uh, very poverty stricken uh, conditions that some that we all face at one time. And you know, when you're a kid, it's kind of like if you don't, you never knew any other creature comforts. You know, we thought, oh, this was this was cool. Everybody eats in a big giant dining hall with a whole bunch of men, right? No, they didn't. You know, we did. You know, I used to think, oh, everybody uh, uh, butchered pigs and 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 cow and chicken and everything in the backyard. No, not everybody did that. My friends did not have any uh, experience with that. So. I knew after I would talk about some of the things I experienced and a lot of my white friends would say, ooh, you eat that, you guys do that. I mean, it's like, oh my God, this is not something that I guess I'm, uh, they need to hear about or maybe they should. But um, so that, that's why I say when we had to straddle two cultures, you know, we, we were trying to be accepted in, in one, we were accepted in the other. That was our home. We grew up with Malungs. We grew up with everything that said Filipino. We ate Filipino food. We lived next to Filipino men all our lives, or most of our lives. And so, to us, um, that will always be that will always be my first home. Living in that compo. So, June, you want to tag on that? Well, I'm thinking back on some of the things um, 
I, one of the things that struck me was that Sam and Irwin experienced picking up other Filipino kids. Uh, I was the only one. Um, at the time, I was the only Filipina in Lodi High School. And, um, and I remember inviting friends over. They would come by and uh, some, some of them spent the night. In fact, this is kind of interesting because I went to a reunion about two months ago and a high school reunion. I didn't even remember this, but some of my, was the, my friends, of course, as I said, are Caucasian, came up and said, geez, I remember all those happy times at the camp when I would visit you, and I remember your mom's good food and having all that fun. I don't even remember that, but I thought it was so significant that they enjoyed the camp like I did and that they felt really welcomed and were really impressed by that whole thing. But, um, but yeah, anyway, it was a little bit different when I caught the, caught the bus. And as you said, um, Erwin, after 45 minutes, you are a bit exhausted. And for females, um, I remember standing in the fog, uh, getting all dressed up, standing in the fog, waiting for the bus as the kids all hung out out the window looking for me because I'm standing by the highway and then I hear voices going, there she is, there she is. And by the time I got to high school because of the fog, my hairdo was not the hairdo that I started out with. And so it was a little bit different for me by the time I got to school after 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah. the, the camp, uh, the second camp in the 60s that Erwin and I uh, grew up. It was it was a uh, it was quite different than you than Luna's and June's experience in that it was one of those large camps owned by the all powerful uh, families that controlled every aspect of the camp, including mm -hmm. transportation, food structure, pay, everything. So, it, it, and so it was it was quite different than. Uh, when when we lived at the Bazanich camp, <clears throat> uh, my, luckily my I mentioned my dad was uh, the foreman, so you know I, I had the opportunity to go wherever he went, and and he, as a as a young child he would you know, on the weekends he would take me with, and <clears throat> in the summer times I would work in the fields with him, and t when I was thirteen I was on the payroll, <clears throat> so and and so. There was a lot of uh, really uh, interesting encounters with all the Manongs. And, and I think, you know, uh, following up on what Erwin said about the Manongs, <clears throat> they, were, they were not a monolithic group. They weren't one just big block of the same type of people. They, they were all different and, and they had all different uh, backgrounds and educations. And, and so <clears throat> it, that was a really uh, interesting thing because they 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 like my parents they they followed the the same mantra of you know if you want to compete in america you have to get an education you have to you have to uh be educated so go, stay in school you don't want to be like us working in the fields crawling in the grapevine you don't want to do that so <clears throat> the the experience i had with the monarchs was it, they were sort of like a secondary education because they were very knowledgeable about what was going on in the world. And like Erwin mentioned, there was very few uh, lessons about what really was happening in the 60s. In the 60s, it was, a, you know, all these events were happening and, and the Manungs were on it. And I, I remember a lot of political conversations, you know, some of them were pro Republicans, some of them are Democrats, and I would listen and they would explain. And and so a lot of my education really was with what the Manums were bringing up. You know, for, in the 60s, everything from the Cuban Missile Crisis to, you know, Martin Luther King's assassination to Woodstock, I, those guys, they were on it. And they were giving me their opinions. And I, I uh, you know, <clears throat> looking back, I, I was a, a former high school teacher. And the history of what we had gone through, <clears throat> and a lot of it was introduced and uh, you know piqued my interest by by the Manongs. 
and 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 so that that I was lucky uh, because they were able to to do that. Um, anyway, I just really to back up before you know if we if we talk about the mountains, we have to talk about Irwin mentioned uh, Filipino town in Delano on Glenwood Street, and that was like it was a happening place. It was post war, World War II, and they were <clears throat> they were out on Philip. On in Filipino Town, Glenwood Street, all the gambling joints and the restaurants, pagoda. My dad would pick us up and take us there just so we could recruit them in. And <clears throat> down the street was Filipino Community Hall. And that is where it was sort of the epicenter of all the social activities. All the women uh, organized the Women's Catholic League and, you know, and all the parties that would happen there. We even did the the uh, pageants, you know, that you, if you wanted to make money, you sold tickets. I don't know if you guys did that back in your, in your farms. You sold tickets and then you became a, a princess and uh, or a prince like I, I was, you know, and all my my friends, they all did the same thing. Yeah, you, me too, you know, that kind of thing. So the Filipino Community Hall was, was part of that sort of a connection, the social connection to the camps. And, and also it was so important to... Uh, uh, and I'm really sorry when they tore down Filipino town on Glenwood Street, that mm -hmm. it, it was, there was no ceremony, no pictures, no conversation. And yet in the 1950s and 60s, it was, it was the center of all the Filipino activity, especially the young Manungs that came back from the war. And, and I'm sorry that that, that, that had happened. So Sam, I wanted to elaborate one one other point. You mentioned that uh, in the camps we we were uh, part of a, a system that was just large corporation, and they controlled your housing, your lives, livelihoods, uh, everything. Uh, they are, they they also controlled education because the growers were the board of education at the time, and so it even made it more important that the monos. The, the education that they would they would tell you about and, and, and their their through their own eyes what um, you know the Martin Luther King assassination was and the Cuban Missile Crisis was um, even even it, it it kind of made it more important that that the monos were, were were that part of your life and and it was it was clear that when we were growing up Sam that. The, the whole plantation mentality, they, they controlled everything. They controlled when your mom was, was going to babysit at Christmas time, you never saw your mom. Yeah, yeah. They, they took your, your pets, not one, but all of them, whenever they wanted to. So mm -hmm. the, 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 that, that statement of control mm -hmm. is huge. I mean, um, but it, it was a major motivation for us to overcome a lot of this stuff. So. In a way, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, anyway. But you, that was not our experience because, as I said earlier on, my parents owned and operated our Filipino labor camp. Yet we, we did face a lot of hardships because, um, you know, we, we had to take care of, of the Manongs that when they got sick, um, they're, they did not have family, so we were their family. And uh, there were about maybe 10 um, at the most that would stay year round at, at, at the camp. And, and uh, there always were other little chores that they provided um, to us and they would work odd jobs, odd jobs as well. But, um, but for the most part, you know, a lot of the, uh, the care, um, the support, um, you know, that came from from us as a family for the Manoons that had no families of their own. I was telling a story earlier on um, before we started taping um, about remembering how all the men would come into our house every Friday night to watch the 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 fights. Remember the See. Gillette. Fights, you know, yeah. I, I still remember all those commercials and I re ribbon. yeah, Paps Blue Ribbon commercials. <laughs> and I remember they'd all, they'd all parade in the house and I would yeah. stand there 
I would pretend I was, um, you know, the, the, the lady at the movies, you know, with the ticket. I mean, we didn't charge them anything, but it was just fun to see them walking in. So, but it, they crowded into our living room. I mean, there, there, there'd be like maybe 20, 30 monos sitting in our living room watching on this little picture tube of a TV. And to watch them and all their movements, they were all moving and, you know, if you ever watch Filipinos when they're watching a fight, they're like in the fight themselves. I mean, body was, English. yeah, the body English was definitely there. I would just crack up. But that's, that's some of my fondest memories. Later, Mama decided, never mind, they're not coming in the house anymore because all the mud, all the sand, you know, everything coming in the house. So then she bought him a TV and put it in the pool hall. So then they have their own place to watch, uh, to watch whatever, you know. So, so, but, but that was one of my more fondest memories. But um, one of the things that I wanted to say before we, 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 uh, each of us say our closing remarks is that I'm glad we do things like this because I'm reminded of the fact that so many of the younger generation don't know about the sacrifices and the fact that we stand on the shoulders of those very monoms that sacrifice so much. Um, I remember when I, I used to live here in Stockton and I was on a, um, a nonprofit, a Filipino multi-service center uh, organization board. And I remember uh, this was in the um, 80s and uh, we were recruiting for board members and this very um, dapper looking uh, Filipino guy, and he was from the Philippines, he was a lawyer from the Philippines, he was currently studying uh, to get his, uh, he, he was doing an internship with the city and he came because he wanted to be on our board. But he came off very, he, he seemed very arrogant to me. I didn't know a lot about him. I asked him the question as why he felt, why did he want to get on the board? And his answer was, well, I am, I am a lawyer. At least I am not a farm worker. There was total silence when he said that. If I had something to throw, throw across to him, I probably would have. But I think my words were uh, enough of a dagger, hopefully. <laughs> but... I was sitting in between two manongs that were on that board, those same manongs that uh, he stood on their shoulders. If not for them, he wouldn't have had a federally funded training program so he could become a lawyer, and we told him that. So obviously, uh, he did not get uh, approved on our board. But my message here is the fact that you cannot forget the struggles and sacrifices that many of the the Mon Monons did, uh, experience that came over in the 20s and the 30s. If not for them, there would not have been uh, the accomplishments that just the four of us right here, all of us were able to go, you guys were all alumni of San Jose State, so were my brothers and, and my sister. I'm, I'm also a college graduate. We all have done things in, in, in our respective fields, things that were dreams that the Mon Monons had, and I'm glad that, you know, we realized that for them because, you know, they will never be forgotten because uh, they left us that legacy. Yeah, I, th I think that that's really, really important to um, remember all of the things. Their lives were very, very hard, but they had this faith, and I think you can take a look at how it was that all of us grew up with this sense of community and supporting one another. And they had that belief about how things could get better by people having a commitment to be together and to support one another. And I felt that through the camp. Um, I was all, they encouraged me to go to college. Uh, they encouraged me to do the very best that I could. That was at a time when Luna and I grew up that, you know, uh, women had certain things that were already um, pre-established for them. But I grew up thinking I could do anything I wanted to do. And it was because the Manons instilled that in me. And so 
their lives were very, very difficult, but they figured it out. Their lives were controlled, but they figured it out and how it could be better for them, but mainly for us, for the families that, um, that we all cared about. And so they built that sense of community together. We did that at the camp and we did that in our social circles in, in town. And I'm grateful for them to, for doing that for me. Um, I think that uh, it, it built my, my social skills my empathy skills. Um, I really think that my career is based on that kind of thinking, of valuing the inclusion of everyone. And through all of that, what they went through, um, they held on to those, those kinds of values. And so I, I, I agree. We're standing on the shoulders of giants. My, my recollection and it was earlier when when uh, Luna was talking about taking care of the old men, the Manungs, when they got old. And I, I had a, a memory, and I, I just to share, <clears throat> when there was there were a lot of different men that that you know Manungs that came and went, and but there there were a core group that stayed at the camps and didn't. Do, uh, didn't do the migratory thing. Most of them are the older men. And, and uh, a lot of them imparted a lot of wisdom just because they were older, wiser, and they knew I was a kid and they really wanted to you know, show me the right direction. And so one of them was, his name was Tata Pabian. And he, he was a, and there were many of them like him, you know, well-spoken, very intelligent, uh, worldly, knowledgeable, uh, open-minded and so you know i i would gravitate to him because he he would talk about all kinds of different things about careers about uh, do you want to be an engineer and i didn't even know what an engineer was i thought it was a guy that drove a train yeah. and, you know and so i he would just enlighten me so one of the one of the one of the sad things i remember is one one day uh, some of the the men came to the knocking on our door and said you know, they would call my dad Mina. Hey, Mina, Mina, there's a, there's a problem. So I, my dad would go and I would follow him. And, and it turned out that Tati Pabian had a, he was, he had a stroke and was hemorrhaging and he had passed away. Mm. My dad walked into his room and, you know, it was, it was a simple room with a light bulb and it was kind of dark and overhanging his, his bunk bed. And there he was, and he was, he, he had passed away. There was blood, he was hemorrhaging through his ears and his nose. And, and I thought to myself, is that it? Is that what happens to all these guys? They, they just kind of, they mm -hmm. die and nobody's there for them. They, you know, the county coroner came in, the, they took him by an ambulance and they probably cremated him. And I didn't know what happened to him. And so here was this really cool guy that kind of just passed into history. And he, he imparted something about compassion, you know, to, to be passionate, but also to have compassion, you know, and, you know, there are so many things that he did and, and, and he was not the only one. There were a lot of men like him. And so, yeah, there, there was, you know, those monos, they, they really did ha uh, have impact, I, I'm sure, on all of us. And, and that's just one of the many stories that, that I got from from that and, and and they would always again they would always have my mom and dad's back they would they would they would always you know expose the mantra of get an education compete if you want to compete you got to be educated mm -hmm. you're going to get out of the fields you, there's your opportunity is there don't throw it away you know that that kind of a that kind of encouragement so yeah they they were the the lives of the monos really did uh, influence us, and and for sure, just just that one instant, uh, it did. But I have to tell you, the camp was way way wild because <laughs> there was a lot of funny things, and I'm hoping I'm hoping you guys ex uh, uh, bring up your memories. Uh, like an example would be one time. It, we, we, we had our money and we would buy Cracker Jacks because you could, you could get a prize in the Cracker Jack box. 
So we, we got a magnifying glass. And so me and my friends, there was like three of us, uh, four of us. We were, we were magnifying the light on, on ants and we were trying to catch the ants on the ground. And so we were, we were, we were doing that. And I, we, I look up and I, I turned around and we set the whole wheat field on fire behind oh. us. This giant fire is happening. And the, the telephone post is on fire across the camp, right? And so we, we might have, we, we could burn down the camp. So in our panic, we dropped our pants down and we started peeing. Four little boys, eight years old. We were like eight or nine years old. We we're peeing on the, we we're trying to pee on the burning uh, pole, telephone pole. And you couldn't even get close to it because the heat was like killing you. And we couldn't reach it with our pee. And luckily, the, my dad drove up in, in, a, in the bus full of old, full of the men working. And they all ran out and they, they are all putting the fire out and they're getting the hose and all that. Needless to say, the spanking that I got from my dad was like <laughs> memorable. It was like, <laughs> so there were a lot of funny stories as well. It wasn't all, um, it wasn't all the heartache and sadness. There, there was a lot of funny stories. And, and Erwin was a lot of part of a lot of crazy things we did. <laughs> Well, when you're kid, when you're kids, you do stuff. Yeah. My sister, my sister tried to burn down the uh, the the coops where all the uh, the roosters were, oh. the prize fighting roosters. Well, so well, Luna, you can only imagine. Luna, uh, <laughs> I, 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 this is a story for another day, but I think I succeeded in doing so. What you just mentioned, so. Um, Anyway, I, what I wanted to do is thank everybody. I mean, these, these stories are amazing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that as a follow-on, because we broad brushed so many things, that perhaps we could all get together over, over dinner or lunch or, or just to get together and, and just put a, a camera on and we, 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 we record more of this. That'd this, be great. This would be That'd really be great. great. Yes. But, before I leave, I, I'd like to kind of give a, a my takeaway of of what I just heard and and my ideas of, of what the camp meant to me. Uh, you guys all mentioned all these things of, of family, uh, of all the, uh, the struggles, all these things that, that the Monos went through, and we started talking about the camp. I think it's incumbent on us to continue that mantra, that story, that that the advice that the monos gave us and, and onto the next generation and the next to to gain your education uh, to, to level the playing field the social playing field to compete because mm -hmm. if you won't life won't be so sweet mm -hmm. so having said that i would say that hopefully a message to to everybody out in the audience is that there was a story that started way back when, when these, these models migrated way back in the early 1900s, and it's still ringing in all of us here. Yes. And mm -hmm. I, I would hope that people would latch on and, and latch on this, the, something that, of a cause that, uh, for, for not only us or our, our family, but also our people. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'd like to leave it with. And uh, anyway, Thank you, Luna. Thank you, June. Thank you, Sam. And thank you for any audience we do have out there. And if you can, uh, if you have any questions of us, um, you can send an email to uh, you can send an email to me, and I'll try to answer it on behalf of the panel. Uh, that would be Lou Jam. 1943, no, Jamero 1943 at gmail.com. Very easy, I and, think. And but, I, I think you can get to the website for the museum would be Yeah, and the, and the museum as well. But I want to thank especially uh, Terry Torres and Chris Castro from the uh, Stockton Fonts National Museum for giving us the TA and the camera time to do this or else we wouldn't be here because you know, us oldies, we're not especially good at being techies, but I think the stories, the stories we have are so many, we cannot really even touch upon or scratch the surface in an hour. But it's been our, it's been my honor, my joy, my pleasure for sharing my time with all of you.
So good night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.